good morning everybody and thank you for taking the time to attend today um, i do always wish that i was doing these in person rather than online but we'll get there i'm sure within the next year um, so my name is claire and i essentially reconstruct past landscape and climate change um, i'm a marine geoarchaeologist so i do that beneath the sea and given the theme of climate change in you know the festival of archaeology i thought i'd talk about one specific event, a quite significant event in sort of human history terms, and that is the drowning of Dogland. Um, and it's difficult to gauge people's, um, you know, founding knowledge of, of Dogland in this event. And we may have some experts listening, and we also may have pe people who are quite new to it. So I'm going to try and cover the whole range of it and somehow meet in the middle. Um, so I do apologise if we get a bit sciencey in some cases, um, but I will do my best to keep you all with me. Um, so, Doggerland is a term that at least the public are getting a lot more familiar with now, and it, it's this idea of these vast landscapes, terrestrial landscapes, that exist beneath what is now the North Sea. Um, and I always like to use this cartoon because it's very difficult for us to visualise, you know, when we think of maps of the past, um, we need to, an image, we need to see what this looks like. And this is a cartoon, and there are some sort of inaccuracies within this which I'll just point out in a moment but I think one important point that I always like to make straight away is that over the period of human history the sea level has been much lower than it was today and the area of Doggerland or all of the land that is now covered by shallow seas around Britain and Northern Europe um, has existed for 90% of the time so the way we think of our geography today is very very misrepresentative when we think of human history and I think that's quite an important point point. Um, but if you look at this um, image we think of Doggerland and we're interested in trying to find the archaeology within Doggerland but for sea levels to be lower than they are today so that we can expose this area of seabed there needs to be a huge ice sheet and all of that water gets locked up in this ice sheet um, and this is the extent of the ice sheet when it was at its maximum during the last ice age um, and you can see it is quite extensive and if you that previous image of Doggerland showed this huge landscape but the reality of it is if you can see my mouse Doggerland itself is actually a lot smaller in terms of what would have been habitable for humans and our ancestors and um, you know this is not somewhere you're going to want to live up here the environment's also pretty cold so when sea levels have fallen by up to 120 meters when all these the, that water's locked up in these ice sheets the sort of sweet spot we would be looking at for finding archaeology is these southern parts of the North Sea um, and one other thing I just wanted to point out is again if that ice sheet melts and we have a situation where the ice sheet is much smaller and it's just located here over Scotland by that time sea level is rising so again we're in a situation where the entire landscape is not exposed because sea level has risen and this sort of rough blue sketch here shows the likely position of the coast as that sea level rises in this scenario a scenario and again it's the southern north sea that's the sort of sweet spot so those ice sheets are very destructive and they are bulldozers so any archaeology that's within that landscape is going to get completely destroyed. Um, so we want to go south of that ice sheet margin, but we also want to be in this area that didn't flood immediately. Um, so this is where a lot of our research and investigations on Doggerland landscapes tend to happen. It's in the southern part of the North Sea. Um, so this is hopefully, I, I'm not going to make those people switch off. Um, it's a way that we're trying to represent human history, climate change, and major events that have occurred over the past million years. Um, so present day time is over this end of the graph, and we're going back a million years. Um, and on this axis, we show sea level. So this red squiggly line here shows changes in sea level. And you know, present day sea level is very high, at the maximum of an ice age it's 120 meters approximately lower but hopefully you can see from this you know we talk about doggerland flooding at the end of the last ice age 
But that's not a single event in human history. That event has occurred oops, on multiple occasions. Um, and it's cyclic and predictable. And those cyclic climate changes that we experience in the past are a lot to do with the Earth's orbit around the sun, the wobble of the Earth. Um, so we have we can predict that in some way. And when we reconstruct past landscapes, we see that climate change. So a lot of people, when we think about future climate change, say, well, climate's always change. So what's the big deal? Um, I think it's important to recognize that climate's never changed as fast as it is during the present day. And that's the key difference. Um, but I'm going to talk mainly about the most recent drowning event of Doggerland. But we do look further back in time and we do look at these other events in the past um, and extending the archaeological record much further back. Um, my colleague Andy Shaw has given a talk at 12 o'clock today. And um, what's quite important about this is for every ice age and low sea level, and then it follows a warm stage, and we call it an interglacial period, like we're in the present day and sea level is much higher. Every time that happens, the geography of Northern Europe changes. And that geography has a huge impact on human migration pathways. Um, partly as humans are migrating north and south in response to climate because the climate gets too cool in the north so they tend to migrate south and then they return as climate warms at the end of the ice age but the geography of the north sea and how britain is connected to europe is quite significant and we know that we have periods this little red line here oh, apologies we have periods where humans are present and in periods where humans are absent and Andy is going to talk about that in a bit more detail today. I'm very much a sort of environment landscape person and um, I certainly am not a specialist in terms of the archaeological record but tune in for that one at 12 o'clock today. So this is what Doggerland looks like today and this is what I have to work with. Um, quite a challenge it's a challenge if you're working on land trying to reconstruct past environments but if you're working in the sea it gets a bit more tricky um we just need to use different data types and the record is a lot more fragmented because we have historically not investigated the seabed as much as we have as land but for me in some ways that's that's the beauty of it is that i feel a little bit like an explorer sort of mapping the seabed for the first time um, and a lot of the work that we're doing at Wessex Archaeology from a commercial point of view is we're working with developers in the offshore wind industry. And the sort of irony of it is that the work we are doing with them um, to help get consent and to help support the development of offshore wind is a clean energy that, you know, we are all striving for to help us reduce the impact of future climate change. But in that mission to reduce that impact, we're learning more about climate change in the past. And um, I quite like the irony of that. If I just scroll down. So some questions about the drowning of Doggerland. So I'm gonna focus on these today and hopefully answer them as best I can. So we think about how did it drown? Now I've given um, talks in the past to various audiences and I, and I don't know whether somebody's already put it in the questions comment, but lots of times I get asked, what about the tsunami? Um, so people talk about 8,000 years ago, there was a landslide in the Norwegian, off just off the Norway coast. And um, that landslide caused a huge tsunami and it flooded Doggerland. People talk about that being responsible for, you know, the demise of Mesolithic communities in the North Sea at that time. Um, other more sort of less dramatic, less exciting, um, theories are that it's just post-glacial sea level rise it's just as the ice sheets melt sea levels rise and the whole area floods um so that's the sort of how doggerland flooded um when it happened eight thousand years gets quoted quite a lot um both science well at least historically in scientific literature but also in the public um how fast it is again is it an instant event like a tsunami or is it more, more gradual and if it is gradual what What's the time scale of that and how that how does that compare to what we're dealing with in the future in terms of the rates of climate change and sea level change? Um, and yet what what happened to the coastal configuration? What was the geography of northern Europe as Doggerland drowned? And what was the impact of that on you know, migration pathways into Britain um, and the impact on people? 
So I'll come back to these questions at the end, but th that's sort of what I'm going to try and address as I go through this talk. Um, whoops. So I investigate submerged landscapes. This is not a submerged landscape, um, but this gives you an idea of what we are looking for um, in terms of our best bet of finding archaeology. So this is the margin of a river, very vegetated. There's, you know, the river provides a fresh freshwater resource. Um, there is food, both in terms of, you know, there's fauna, there's animals in the area attracted to the freshwater. So, you know, great place to hunt, there's shelter. And um, so these are ideal settings for occupation of the landscape. But from a preservation of the archaeological record, the margins of rivers and also coastal environments, they're very wet and waterlogged. Um, so that environment is great at preserving organic material. And that could be the hide from the cattle. It could be the wooden trackway that you know these people are building, or it can be plant remains from the vegetation that's growing around. So this is an ideal setting. If we want to find material, which we often call deposits or sediments, and I'll, I'll use both of those terms throughout the talk. It's essentially the clays, the muds, the sands, the gravels laid down by the river and just forming in the environment. And um, if we want to find the, this material, then we want to look for this type of landscape. And in reality, when you're beneath the sea, um, this looks quite straightforward, but it's, it, it, it's a bit more tricky. It's extremely tricky. But it's possible. Um, so using marine geophysics, essentially using mainly sound to take acoustic images of the seafloor or what's beneath it, we can see evidence of those past landscapes and the environment, such as a river where we know we may find archaeology along the margin. And this is an absolute beautiful example. So the image on the my my left. Um, is a bathymetry image. So it's basically the elevation of the seabed where the blue colours are deeper and the green colours are shallower. And you can see a lovely sinuous meander bend and what looks like a little oxbow lake next to it. The equivalent, equivalent environment that we'd see in the modern day is presented just next to it. So we can see these features. Um, I'd say one in a million times do we see something as beautiful as this and we need to use our imagination a bit more, especially as we look deeper below the seabed. Um, but we these environments are preserved and we need to investigate them, um, you know, so that we can try and understand that past landscape change element. Um, but this is just an images of, of the seabed and what mainly what I do is geoarchaeology. So I need physical samples um, and there are a number of ways to do this. But this example here is something called a vibracore and it's almost a, it's like a drain pipe tube. It's six meters long that gets placed on the seabed. Vibration pushes that six meter tube into the seabed. And then we pull that back up, chop it into one meter sections. And the image here will show you all the different layers. Um, so with the idea that the stuff at the bottom of the core is older, um, we call this a core sample, sorry. So those deposits or sediments at the base of the core are older than the ones at the top. So that should essentially provide us a record of what has built up through time. Um, and we can use the nature of the sediments to try and understand what environment they were laid down in. Was it a river? Was it a coast? Um, and we can also look at the microfossils or the remains within those sediments. Um, and I've got some examples here. We've got a tiny shell called a foraminifera. Um, they live in marine environments. So if we find them in a sediment, then we know it was a marine environment, which is very, very good when you're working beneath the sea at getting rid of all of the stuff that is marine and you're not particularly interested in. Um, and we get plant remains so we can see what vegetation was grown. We see seeds. And the other image is um, a pollen grain. So all of you suffering from hay fever at the moment, all that pollen in the air and in the atmosphere gets laid down within these sediments in the past. And it tells us what trees and what vegetation was growing in the area. So we use all of these techniques. Um, we mix them all together because in some ways they prove each other or they yeah, corroborate each other. And we reconstruct the environment. And if we're lucky enough to get any plant remains or organic remains, we can use radiocarbon dating to get dates. And um, so 
I am going to talk about a project that we have been working on at Wessex for a while now. It's a wind farm in the Southern North Sea or a collection of wind farms in Norfolk Vanguard and Norfolk Boreas. Vat and Fall are the developer and Royal Hasconing are the consultants. And I just want to thank them again for letting me present this. And um, they've been great at supporting this type of research. Um, and I'm going to talk about one core. We have, or we, I spend most of my days um, looking at core records, um, but this is just one single cure. And I, I, I was so happy when we found it. Um, but we got, it's six, six meter fiber course, that drain pipe went into the seabed. Um, this photograph isn't the greatest, but hopefully you can see some changes. And I'm just going to go from the base of this core all the way to the top. And I'm going to talk you through what we have found and what that tells us about how the environment changes in Doggerland. Um, so at the very bottom of the oldest deposits, we found some sand. We looked at something called ostracods, which are very small shells. Um, and some ostracods live in freshwater environments, some live in marine environments, and we found that they were freshwater. So we knew that these sands were in a terrestrial, freshwater, probably high energy river environment. Um, we looked at the pollen within it. Um, the pollen indicated that there wasn't much vegetation around. It was a very barren landscape. Um, and the species that were in there indicated that it was cold. So we know we've got river environment, cold climate, barren landscape, and we have a radiocarbon date just above that deposit here. So we know that, that this environment formed before 12,000 years ago from that radiocarbon date. So this is, this is the North Sea landscape or the landscape of Doggerland where the ice sheets have retreated, but sea level hasn't quite got close enough yet. And it yeah, it, it start, things are starting to change quite rapidly. And we see that as we move further up through the core. So I'm moving up now into something that, um, this is a peat deposit. So peat is um, essentially decomposed plant remains and fragments, and they form in waterlogged environments, as I said before. And that waterlogging stops them from decomposing very quickly. So you can get really long environmental records in peat deposits. Um, so, again, looking at the pollen that was preserved in this and looking at the plant fragments and the seeds, we could reconstruct that this peat was forming along the margin of a river. So our previous sandy deposit was a river environment, but climate's changing and there's more vegetation. And that vegetation is stabilising the river and creating what is almost reed, a wetland reed environment. But trees are returning, so areas of slightly higher ground or drier ground, and um, we're starting to get woodland, and we see that in the pollen records. So, in terms of people living in this environment, things are getting much more hospitable. Um, and through radiocarbon dating, we know that the peat started forming 11,700 years ago, and it stopped forming 9,500 years ago. So we've got almost 3,000 years of environmental history here within 70 centimetres of a deposit. So it's rare when we get these types of, um, we, we recover this material, but when we do it, it's so precious and so significant. I feel very lucky that I got a chance to work on it. Um, so moving up through time and also upwards within the core. Um, one thing I know, just want to point out here, the peat gradually, sorry, it's just this one. I've moved into the upper section of the core. The peat gradually changes into clays and silt, so very muddy deposits. Um, and when we split them open, we can see that they are laminated. Um, and what's even more interesting about that is each of those laminations, it isn't um, flat, it sort of, it dips or it slopes in a certain direction. But if you look at the lamination above that, it dips and slopes in the opposite direction. And what's quite key about that is that indicates us that the current is moving in one direction and it lays down some material. And then the current switches and goes in the opposite direction. So the only processes that we know that do that are tidal environments. So the tide comes in and then the tide goes out in a different direction. So we've switched from what is a wetland environment to a tidal. Um, tidal setting. And within this, again, we've got pollen preserved that tells us 
the vegetation's changed to species that are much more tolerant of saline conditions. So this is the influx of salt water as sea level rises. Um, and we see lots of marine or shells, marine shells that can withstand brackish saline sort of environments. Um, so here, we know water depth is changing. That's having an impact on the vegetation. It's changing the environment. Sea levels getting very close. And because we radiocarbon dated the top of the peat just here, or sorry, just here, this change in environment must have occurred at approximately 9,700 years ago. And I say approximately with the caveat of probably plus or minus a couple of hundreds of years, which for people working in much more recent archaeological periods seems horrendous. But if you work in prehistory, you accept that level of uncertainty. You become very comfortable with it. And it can certainly get worse the further back in time you go. Um, so essentially, one single core in the centre of the North Sea within a wind farm um, can show us that we've got 3,000 years of environmental change, changing from this open freshwater sort of barren landscape to a wetland environment, much more hospitable, and then sea level gets pretty high and you turn into a coast. So our job or what we're trying to do is find archaeological sites or archaeological materials. And you know, I've spoken a lot about the landscape here, but this is extremely important because we know that people live along floodplains of these types of river environments and we often find a rich archaeological record associated with those types of deposits and the same for the wetland margins of a you know a river channel you, we have preserved trackways um, and other material and for example with a coast we can see shell middens so we know people can live in these environments and they would have been living there in dogland um, and the next step is how do you find the archaeology associated with that um, I personally haven't had such luck so far, um, but researchers at University of Bradford led by um, Professor Vince Gaffney last year did a survey just north of the wind farm site that I was just talking about. And they recovered worked flint artifacts on the margin of a paleo channel. So that's just an old river channel as it turned into an estuarine environment as it met the coast. So we know in the Southern North Sea, there is flint preserved along the margins of those features. And we are mapping those features within wind farm sites. And we are using the cores that we recover to try and understand how the environment changed so that we can place any human activity within that doggerland landscape. But to come back to the sort of theme of the talk, which is drowning of doggerland, Based on this core, I hope this is not too controversial, and I do I do mean it in jest, but within a single one metre section of core, we've gone from a terrestrial landscape where Britain was a peninsula of Europe. We are recording sea level rise with these tidal deposits and the coastal environmental change. And then up towards the top, we have marine sands. So at this point, at this location in the North Sea, Britain is no longer a peninsula and Britain becomes an island geographically. Um, and I just really wanted to emphasize how rare it is. We often, you know, we study many cores from the Southern North Sea and occasionally I might get 10 centimeters of this peat. Other times I might get, you know, five centimeters of these coastal deposits, but they're all little fragments here and there. This was the first time that we got it in a single core um, and all of the material and the fossils that were in it were really good preservation and high concentration that enabled us to reconstruct environmental change over such a long period of time. Um, so it's quite special to work on. Um, so that's sort of, if you think, if you're looking at a single core and we're looking at temporal changes, um, so changes over 3,000 years, this is a model a, which is pretty good at trying to understand what the geography looked like at that time period. And it's work that was undertaken by Fraser State at Southampton, it's not my work. Um, but hopefully you can just about see the red lines on here. Sorry, my mouse has been a bit slow. So this is that wind farm and our core was taken somewhere in the north up here. And this is what the geography of the North Sea would have looked like 10,000 years ago with the red colors being high ground and the blue being the sea 
essentially. And these greeny yellow colours are your low lying coastal lands. Um, so 10,000 years ago, in our core, we've got peat forming. Um, so we're in that wetland semi terrestrial environment. And the model tells us that in the northern part of this site, that is correct. We are in a terrestrial environment. So we are almost confirming um, the model's results. And I will say that this is a computer model. Um, so it's almost predictive using lots of different inputs. Um, but what we notice here is we've got this land bridge through the central North Sea connecting the Netherlands to sort of North Norfolk and the eastern Yorkshire coast. Um, when I don't know many articles that I read or at least stuff that I see in the public realm that always talks about land bridges at Dover Straits and I always think this is quite important to realise is that by this point Dover Straits was closed so people were not migrating across through the Dover Calais region in the English Channel. Any migration into Britain would have been much more northern within the North Sea at this time. Um, and then the model moves on 500 years, so sea levels are rising still um, in the northern part of the site. We're getting quite close to being a coast. Um, you can just see by these blues here. So we're probably in a coastal setting. And if you remember from what I said previous, within that core sample, we dated the flooding of that environment to 9,700 years ago. So it was in it is within this window here, and we think the coast is just getting here. So the landscape's changing, and again we are confirming the model. But what's interesting here is you can see the land bridge is starting to be squeezed. It's getting much more narrower. So if you are people, if you were living in this environment and you're following the coast for your resources, um, you're following the rivers as well, and you know, the most habitable places for you to live, then as this environment this sort of volume, not volume, area of land gets smaller and smaller. People are almost going to get squeezed and concentrated into a single area. So if I was going to go looking for archaeology, this is certainly the area that, that I would concentrate on. And interestingly, the flint that I showed you from the Lost Frontiers project that was found earlier in the year is from just round here. It's a river channel just in this area. Um, so we can use this model to help us predict where we might find archaeology. Um, and then finally, by 9,000 years ago, the model predicts that the, the area will be flooded and the land bridge is almost disappearing or disintegrating. There's still people living in the North Sea in these sort of last little fragments of a peninsula. But the main connection between Britain and Europe will have pretty much gone by this point. And I'll, I think I just forgot, I should have pointed out, this area up here is called Dogger Bank, and it often gets confused with Dogger Land, um, where Dogger Land is the entire North Sea landscape. Dogger Bank is a particular high point, um, and they are building wind farms up here, so it does get picked up a lot in sort of press and public realm. But this is an island by this point. Um, so the the archaeological record in I would expect within Dogger Bank would be completely different to what we see down here because people are almost stranded on this island where it was with the land bridge you, there's a chance for you to migrate um, either into Britain or into Europe depending on what side depend, yeah depending on what side of the bridge you're on um, so that tells us how the coast changed um, largely driven by this model but we're now starting to get the physical material and the radiocarbon data to be able to test this and prove that it is correct. So thinking about the questions that I raised initially, um, so how how did Doggerland drown? Um, there is a tsunami and there is evidence for tsunami deposits within some cores in the North Sea, but I think it's all, always important to realise that tsunamis are catastrophic and almost instantaneous. Um, and the waters, flood waters come in and the flood waters go back out and they do have a very devastating impact on the landscape and would have had that the same devastating impact on any people living there. But the flood waters disappear, they don't stay. So a tsunami can't be responsible for drowning the Southern North Sea. Um, and it might seem fairly obvious, but I do quite often 
get asked that question it is the, it's the post glacial sea level rise it's just the gradual rising sea level um, and when did that occur so for the core that we were working on it occurred around nine and a half thousand years ago but there's going to be a difference in when that occurred depending where you are in the north sea and what elevation you are at and if we are to fully understand the timing of that how that impacts the geography which will in turn have an impact on migration pathways into britain we need more cause of that standard um, and, and sort of more research to try and get a bigger picture of how it changes with time and also space in different areas of the north sea um, so how fast did it happen quite often get this question as well what we can see from mainly the model that i just showed um, it certainly happens over a period of about a thousand years. Now, if you think about human history, and certainly if we think about future climate change, most of us can't grasp a change that happens over a thousand years because that's, you know, 10 to 15 lifetimes. But in, I suppose, in geological terms, that's very rapid to go from a completely exposed terrestrial landscape with trees everywhere to be completely submerged by the sea that's a significant environmental change over quite a short period of time um, and the configuration of the coast i just really wanted to highlight that it, it's the northern route to the p you know this again this cartoon image here um isn't quite accurate people aren't really coming across in this direction and andy Shaw will talk a little bit more about that because he's going to present lots of work from the french um, records, archaeological records. People are coming through up here in the north, and that has a, an impact on where we may find archaeology in, you know, on land. And, you know, we have some quite key Mesolithic sites in Howick in Northumbria, uh, Star Car in Yorkshire. So it's not surprising that we're seeing, you know, hive of Mesolithic coastal activity in this area if the land bridge was across this part of the North Sea. So it, we can start to use the coastal configuration to build a bigger picture of how it impacts, you know, the record that we see on land as well as beneath the sea. Whoops, and sorry, final question was just what is the impact on people? I um, am more of a sort of environmental scientist rather than an archaeologist. I certainly can't guess what people were thinking in the past, but I just wanted to highlight the time scale again and the rates of change. It's, you're not going to see sea level rising. You certainly won't see it with your visible eye. You won't notice any difference over uh, your lifetime, especially considering how much shorter lifespan was in the past. So people reacted by changing where they lived, but it was over multiple generations. Uh, an individual would have no perception or understanding of climate change. Um, and again, I do often see some comments made or i see things in public literature that gives the impression that people knew how to adapt to it and um, over those time scales it's not visible you can't see it and that's interesting when we think of future climate change now many skeptics would say i don't know what you're talking about there's nothing we can't see climate change but because of how rapid it is occurring I could certainly argue over my lifetime, I'm starting to see changes in, in weather in terms of the storminess. You know, we're in a quite significant heat wave at the moment. I definitely don't remember heat waves as strong as this in the past, although I am from the north and I've moved down south, so that might be the reason. Um, but yeah, it's just quite quite interesting to reflect on on how we as people and humans perceive climate change. Um, so I've been talking a lot about the past. I do a lot of um, STEM, so science, technology, engineering and math engagement events. And every time I get up and talk, there'll be some technology guru or, a, I don't know, someone curing cancer. You know, all these scientists who are all looking to the future and improving our life in the future and basically think that my job is worthless because I'm constantly looking into the past. But I think we can learn. I think we can learn from our past. Um, and the work that we're doing does have some impact. So we're reconstructing past landscapes and many of those landscapes are coastal landscapes who those coasts will have responded to rapid rates of sea level rise, which is exactly the same situation as we are in today. And what we can do from looking at those past coastal environments, 
what we're starting to see is that sea level rise doesn't just gradually increase and then the coast gradually retreats through time. There certainly seems to be almost periods of quiet followed by periods of chaos, which I call thresholds or tipping points. Coasts seem to do okay and seem to adjust um, and almost keep keep up with sea level rise, but something changes and the whole system collapses. Now, if we're trying to protect our current coasts from coastal erosion, having an awareness of what those thresholds are and when those tipping points can occur can help us design better management strategies. Um, like to protect the coast, but also to protect the archaeology along the coast. This is a, an image from Haysborough, so you know, one of the earliest Paleolithic records in Britain. Um, arguably here, coastal retreat is uncovering that archaeology, but um, you know, we can look to the past and learn lessons, sorry, learn lessons from it. Um, another point is, so my job is to find submerged landscapes and if you think about sea level rise or coastal processes and coastal erosion you could argue because sea level rise is aggressive and it it erodes at the coast then it should remove and destroy any archaeological material um, but we know that isn't the case because we can see this image here is another example of a river channel um, we can see that we have rivers preserved, lovely sinuous um, rivers. We know we have deposits like peat preserved, um, and we know that we have archaeology in these environments. So we can learn from past sea level rise, and try to understand why certain environments are not destroyed. Um, and if we can understand which of those environments have the greatest potential to survive then we could, we know essentially where to go and dig although it isn't digging in the marine sense it's a bit more tricking but uh, tricky but we can target the archaeology in those environments so learning from that process of sea level rise in the past and how aggressive it was can help us find archaeology in the modern seabed environment and then just the final point really is um is on reconstructing past sea level rise um the the core that i showed you and that switch from a peat deposit to an intertidal deposit we find records of that on land and in coastal environments and and it's that type of um, context or situation that we use to reconstruct past sea level and from records such as that we can see that in the past sea level rise is not linear and that has historically been something that people um, refer to as a sea level jump. So the rate of sea level rise is gradual, slowly increasing, and then something happens and it completely jumps. Um, and you can get one to two meters sea level rise within 50 to 200 years. Um, there's lots of ongoing research on trying to understand what, how big those jumps are and how short a time do they occur in, because if we experience something like that in the future, if we have a two metre sea level jump within a single lifetime, then the impact of that is catastrophic and completely devastating. So I don't expect any, I don't know, physicists or future scientists to be watching, but if they are, it, you know, we do need to look to the past and we can learn a lot from it.